In this lecture, we want to talk about the uh, isothermal transformation of the iron carbon system. Uh, so in this particular uh, lecture, this part one of two, we're just going to focus on um, what the isothermal transformation curves look like, the kind of microstructures that we could expect from them. And then in part two, we'll do some examples uh, to show you how to actually use these diagrams. So let's first off uh, just think about how do we generate what's called an isothermal transformation diagram. And what I want to point out here is that this sort of curve uh, is what we talked about uh, in the previous lecture on transformation rate. So uh, follows an Avrami uh, equation where we, we begin with uh, no 0% phase transformation and then it rapidly ramps up, 50% transformed, and then finally completes. And as we change the temperature, uh, we change uh, that curve slightly. So what we can use we can use this set of curves to actually develop the the uh, the, the isothermal transformation diagram, or it's also called a time temperature transformation diagram. So all we're going to do is say, okay, I know that this red curve is, exists at 600 degrees C. So I'm going to go ahead and project this first point, the midpoint, and the end point down into this uh, temperature time uh, plot. So if I do that. There I am projecting down to 600 degrees, and I'm going to just plot those points. I'm coloring them green, black, and red just to indicate uh, when the reaction began at 0%, when it hit 50%, and when it uh, got to 100% or completion. And we do that for each of these temperatures. So we, we mark now 650 degrees C, and then we go ahead and mark 675 degrees C. Then what we do is we just basically connect them with a line. And that is hopefully looks a little bit like what we saw in the previous uh, lecture uh, showing you the transformation rate diagram where we have this sort of nose that forms. Um, uh, and we can label each of these curves as where we have 0% perlite, 50% perlite, and 100% perlite. Anything to the left of this green curve is austenite. Of course, anything to the right is going to be perlite. Um, and then this diagram that we just generated is what we call an isothermal transformation diagram or a time temperature transformation diagram. Sometimes I'll just call it a TTT diagram. Okay, so we want to then look through the kinds of microstructures that we can um, uh, talk about using these diagrams. So if the temperature is held close to uh, this is our eutectic, or sorry, eutectoid temperature. If we hold the temperature close to there, uh, like we talked about in the transformation rate problem, we have relatively slow nucleation and relatively fast growth. So that means that we have large structures. Uh, so in this case, we expect there to be thick layers. We call that coarse perlite. If we hold temperature uh, far from the eutectoid temperature, maybe more near the nose, we end up with much thinner layers because we have a high nucleation rate and a slow growth rate. Um, and we are going to get a structure that we call fine perlite. And the only difference really is that coarse perlite has uh, uh, simply thicker layers. And then fine perlite uh, has much closer together and thinner layers. Okay. So all that should be um, fairly straightforward. You, you're familiar with perlite uh, from, from a few lectures ago uh, being the, the eutectoid microstructure that comes out of the iron carbon system. Now let's uh, go ahead and expand to a, another microstructure. This other microstructure is called bainite. Um, it's also a eutectoid microstructure. In this case, uh, the difference is that we end up with these cementite or Fe3C plates in basically an alpha ferrite matrix. The, the transformation requires diffusion, just like it did to perlite. Um, but in order to form bainite, we actually have to cool faster to a lower temperature than perlite. So if this line is the, is the nose, um, uh, then we have so let me let me give you an example. So if we cool to let's say this is just a little above 600 degrees, and we hold, we end up with 100% perlite. If we cool down to let's say 500 uh, and hold, we'll end up with 100% bainite. the The feature of bainite is that it forms just below 
any well anywhere below the nose of this uh, transformation. So if we're in this region below uh, below that nose, then we're going to form bainite. If we're in the region above the nose, we're going to form perlite. Okay, so that's that's if we cool it um, with with sort of the rates that we've talked about there. What if we cool it really fast? Well, if we cool it really fast, we end up with a phase that we call, or a, a microstructure that we call martensite. And it's actually a non-equilibrium body-centered tetragonal phase. Um, so this is a, a micrograph of it. And it's these needles are is the actual martensite, the body-centered tetragonal phase. And they exist in an austenite, uh, remember that's FCC, uh, matrix. Okay, so the feature about this uh, particular transformation is that we convert gamma, which is FCC, to martensite M, which is BCT. It doesn't require any diffusion, and because of that, it transforms very rapidly. Uh, in fact, the percentage of transformation depends only on the temperature to which we rapidly cool it, not on the time. So if you look at a uh, uh, time temperature transformation curve, what we observe is that if we cool fast enough so that we don't form perlite, we don't form bainite, we cool all the way down, uh, and now we're in the uh, this this uh, these horizontal lines correspond to uh, martensitic transformation. So once we get past what's called the martensite start temperature, which in this case looks like it sits at maybe I don't know 225 or something. Then we're going to form martensite, and if once we're there, if we were to hold at this temperature, let's say 200, no new martensite would form, and and it would uh, the um, the composition of, uh, or rather the the relative ratios of martensite, martensite and austenite would remain the same. The only way we could change them is to change the temperature. So it doesn't have. You can see that time has no more effect once we've formed that martensite. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that you need to know about with respect to martensite and why it's kind of an important um, phase in steel is that it actually is the hardest and strongest of all the steel microstructures, uh, but it's also the most brittle too. Uh, so those are the three microstructures that you can expect to see uh, in a time temperature transformation diagram. You can expect to see perlite, bainite, and martensite. And then, of course, if if martensite is formed and it doesn't complete forming, then you're going to have some austenite uh, inside there as well. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, two microstructures that um, that don't show up on a time temperature transformation diagram, but can still be obtained from these microstructures. Uh, the first one is called spheroidite. Uh, it's simply iron carbide, or sorry, uh, cementite particles, these here, these Fe3C, uh, inside of an alpha ferrite matrix. And the reason that they form is, if you remember, we have a, some sort of a surf, we have a surface energy in between phases, in between the cementite phase and the alpha ferrite phase. And uh, if we want to minimize that energy, then we can do that by forming spheres. So the driving force for the formation of spheroidite is a reduction in the alpha Fe3C interfacial area. Obviously, this requires diffusion uh, to, to go from a lamellar or a needle-like structure to this uh, these spheroid particles. Um, but we can create it by basically heating perlite or bainite at some temperature that's just below the eutectoid uh, for long times. Um, the, the feature here is that just when we're heating it, we don't change the composition of the alpha. Uh, obviously, we don't change the composition of the Fe3C because it's a it's a um, uh, intermetallic compound. Um, but also, the weight fractions remain unchanged. We just change the shape of the microstructure. We move from either the lamella or plate to these little these sphere particles. So new microstructure, but the phase is the same. Uh, okay, I want to the last microstructure I want to talk about is called tempered martensite. And I don't want you to be confused. It is it is not the same um, uh, uh, structure as martensite. Uh, it's actually consisting of extremely small Fe3C particles surrounded by an uh, an alpha matrix. So I'm showing you a micrograph of that now. These light colored particles are Fe3C and the dark sitting in this dark alpha matrix. The reason that it's called tempered martin, so note that it doesn't have any gamma and it doesn't have any M. 
So it, it, it has those the equilibrium phases that we would expect from a phase diagram. Um, it actually it's called tempered martensite because we get it by heating martensite to between 250 and 650 degrees C. The reason that this is important is that as a phase, it's nearly as strong as martensite, but it's much less brittle. So that's obviously an attractive feature uh, when we're designing. The other thing that it does is that by, by tempering, by heating this up, uh, it actually reduces some of the internal stresses caused by quenching, which we're going to talk a lot more extensively about in a, in a couple lectures. Uh, but all that is is rapid cooling. So uh, those are the primary microstructures that you should be aware of uh, with respect to the, the isothermal uh, transformation of iron uh, carbon system. Uh, we're going to talk uh, more specifically about how we actually use these TTT diagrams to come up with uh, relative uh, compositions of uh, microstructures due to different um, uh, cooling histories uh, in, the, in uh, part two.